everyone. Uh, welcome back. We're doing uh, some more first aid and CPR. Okay, so we kind of left off with um, uh, some things to think about before you render care. So I talked a little bit about consent. Whatever you're going to do, you have to tell them what you're going to do, right? Because no matter what procedure it is, they need to have consent to actually, um, they need to give you consent in order for you to touch them. So generally you should be point by point explaining what you're doing. If for whatever reason um, it's a child you're working with or an infant, anybody under the age of 18, uh, you need to have a parent or a guardian present to give you um, consent. And if they're not, the only way you can really render care for that, that patient directly without calling 911 um, and letting them deal with it is uh, if it's a life-threatening condition, in which case it's implied consent until they can get parents um, to the child. All right, so... Implied consent is when they're unresponsive, confused, mentally impaired. Maybe they have some sort of developmental delay where they have a guardian, even though they are an adult. Uh, implied consent is if you have a minor with a life-threatening condition and the parent or guardian is not present. Okay. If somebody is awake and alert um, and they're not giving consent for care, don't, don't touch them. Don't mess with them. If you think that they really have something wrong with them uh, that's immediate and needs attention right then, you should be calling 911 so that EMS can kind of deal with it. Now that you have recognized an emergency and decided to take action, follow the emergency action steps. Check. Call. Care. Before rushing to help an injured or ill person, you need to check the scene, so stop and look around. By answering the following questions, you will gain the information you need to proceed. Is the scene safe to enter? Hazards such as fire, spilled chemicals, and traffic, to name a few, could endanger you or any bystanders. If the scene looks unsafe, stay clear and call 911 or the designated emergency number. What happened? Check for clues that might tell you the cause of the emergency. How many people are involved? In an emergency with more than one injured or ill person, you may need to prioritize care. What is going on with the person? Form an initial impression about the nature of the person's illness or injury. If you see severe life-threatening bleeding, take action to control the bleeding using any available resources. Is anyone else available to help? Bystanders may be able to provide valuable information about the situation or the person, along with getting needed items, controlling crowds, and reassuring the injured or ill person. Once you've checked the scene, you need to check the person. If you are not sure whether a person is unresponsive, shout using the person's name if you know it. If there is no response, tap the shoulder for an adult or child, or the bottom of the foot for an infant, and shout again while checking for normal breathing. Check for responsiveness and breathing for no more than 5 to 10 seconds. If there is no response and the person is not breathing or is only gasping, the person needs help right away. This brings us to the second emergency action step. Call. Unresponsiveness, trouble breathing, and severe bleeding are all signs of a life-threatening emergency. If your initial check reveals these or any other life-threatening conditions, make sure that someone calls 911 or the designated emergency number right away. The final emergency action step is to give care according to the conditions that you find and your level of knowledge and training. Always remember, check call care and you'll be ready to respond to any emergency all right 
So that brought up some good points. I want to point out that when you check responsiveness, you don't shake them. If they have a potential head, neck, or back injury that you don't know about, you don't want to exacerbate any of that. Um, so you always tap firmly and shout their name if you know their name, or you shout, are you okay? All right, so before you rush over to anybody, you have to size up your scene. That means that you need to look around and make sure everything is safe. If you come across somebody that's uh, laying on the ground on the side of the road, okay, um, that's not normal, right? So we can determine that an emergency exists. Okay, it's on the side of the road, so am I worried about traffic? Am I worried about um, somebody not seeing me? Um, Okay, but also, how, how did he get there? Was he hit by a car? Was he electrocuted by a downed power line? Did somebody hit him, shoot him, stab him, right? So you need to look around and see if there's any dangers that caused them to be in that position that could ultimately happen to you. Because you can't help anybody if you yourself are injured, okay? Now, while you're looking around your scene, you're looking at... Uh, what could have gotten the patient into the position they're in? Form an initial impression. Like, what do you think happened? Use all of your senses, right? So um, uh, look at how many people are there. What condition are they in? Are they um, incapacitated? Are they unconscious or unresponsive or they're not responding to you? Um, are they uh, injured? Do they ha are they bleeding? Do they have a bunch of deformities or bruises or discolorations? Okay, is there anyone else there available to help? Now, I do have to throw this disclaimer out. Um, sometimes the bystanders are not always the ones there to help you. They're probably, they could be the ones that cause that patient to be in the condition they're in uh, themselves. So, I'll give you an example of a patient of mine I had, and he's he's no longer living, but um, we got called for an unconscious patient. It was, I don't know, one o'clock at night or so. It was pretty late. And so we get there. There's no lights on the street. They're all out. We walk up in the driveway. There's one garage light shining down. It's not very bright. Um, and the there's a car that's up on jacks right the front's lifted up because the guy's working on it and we see one man laying on the floor and then there's another man like basically all we did was see him jumping around from the truck so as we're walking up we look under the vehicle it was wet it was wet and the the fluid was seeping out into uh the rest of the driveway and so we asked the guy we said you know, what's all this liquid, right? Because we're concerned that it could be, it could be battery acid, it could be uh, transmission fluid, oil, um, antifreeze. It could be anything, really, uh, none of which we want to get on ourselves. Um, and the guy says, well, I, he quit breathing, so I dumped water on him. That doesn't work in real life. Like, it's not like Looney Tunes where somebody is um, dead or resting and you dump a bottle of water on them and, and they just magically spring to life. Uh, that's not really the case. So this guy, apparently, uh, per this man that was there with him, um, said that he had been working on his vehicle all day, went and smoked a rock. Okay. So he's, he was hopped up on stimulants to stay up. And um, went back out to work on his car. Only when he went out, he saw that he wasn't breathing and he was laying on the ground. Uh, and that's when he dumped the water on him. And um, so we, we picked him up, put him on the stretcher, and we're asking the guy, you know, hey, this, this, you know, pointing to a patient, what's his name? And he goes, Bob. And later, come to find out that wasn't his real name, but he says Bob. And we says, Bob, is that short for Bobby, Robert, what? And he goes, I don't know, we just always call him Bob. 
And we said, okay, how are you, how do you know this guy? And he says, I'm his brother. I don't know about you, but I, I know my, my siblings' birthdays. So this was really, really fishy that this guy uh, says he's his brother and doesn't know his full name or his birthday. So we get, we get the patient into the back of the truck. And by that time, this other guy had been nonchalantly walking down the street into the darkness. And when we cut the shirt off of this guy because he had stopped breathing by the time we got to the ambulance, by the time we'd, we'd cut his shirt off, um, when I was looking at his chest, he had full body uh, burn scars. And um, in the very center of his chest, he had a foot imprint that later went away. Uh, but it was just very concerning that this other man, um, I have no idea who he was, uh, who claimed he was his brother. I really doubt he was. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I can only speculate, but I'm assuming that he stood on his chest until he stopped breathing. That, that was my, uh, my takeaway from that. But in general, I want that to be kind of a lesson as the people around you, even though they're there, um, people can sometimes be a blessing and they can help you, or uh, they can be a hindrance and they can be harmful. So keep that in mind. So while you're forming your initial impression from your scene size up, start looking at them. Start seeing, is, is this, does this look more medical, like a, an illness, or is this more of an injury? Are they moving at all? Are they motionless? Okay. Does it look like they're struggling to breathe? Do you see any excessive amount of blood? Okay, are they seizing? Are they having an active seizure? These are all things that can kind of help you figure out what's going on. Now, based off of your scene size up and your initial impression, okay, if this already looks like they're severely injured or, um, you know, it looks like they're incapacitated and breathing very hard, like it's hard to catch their breath, right, you may already need to call 911 and see if someone can help you out with some equipment, like an AD, a first aid kit, okay? Uh, the earlier that you get advanced life support coming, the better outcome is gonna be for the patient if it's life-threatening. Provide immediate care for severe life-threatening bleeding. So if you're afraid they're going to bleed out, which if they have accidentally severed a large artery or a vein, they could bleed out within minutes. They could lose that much blood that fast, right? So sometimes there are going to be cases or scenarios where you are going to deliver care first before calling for advanced care. So while you're looking around the scene and getting your initial impression, okay, is the scene safe? If not, are there hazards? Do you need to leave, go somewhere else and call for help? Okay, or can you just not approach the patient? What do you think happened? Um, is there anything around that would give you a clue as to how they were injured? Or, um, you know, are they at home? Do they have medication bottles? Can you look and see what kind of medical history they have um, and why they're in the state they're in? How many people are involved? Uh, especially with injuries, there could be multiple people involved. It could be a car accident. You may have to deal with multiple patients from different vehicles. You may have to, um, you know, deal with a crowd if it's been a fight, that kind of thing. Okay, there might be multiple people that need treatment. And if you need additional resources, you should immediately, as soon as you can, call for them. What's your impression about the nature of the person's illness or injury? Is it life-threatening or not? Is it something you can take care of or not? Okay, is there someone else available to help you, right? If they're actually there to help, it's nice to have a little help sometimes. You know, maybe you need some extra gloves or maybe you need to have them call 911 while you render care, something like that, okay? Are you making that decision to call 911, all right? 
There should be a reason why you call 911. If somebody stubbed their toe and they're just in a lot of pain because they stubbed their toe on the edge of the couch, right? Is that something you'll call 911 for? Why or why not, right? Um, if somebody accidentally tripped and fell while they were carrying a set of kitchen knives and they accidentally impaled themselves, would that be something you would call 911 for? Why or why not? And what, what, um, how bad would it need to be for you to call 911? So it's very important when we get into the first aid portion that you start learning what your capabilities are and what you can handle. Um, and then what you would need additional help from, say, EMS um, or even bystanders. So, we'll get into this activity, but I'm going to put it on the next video. Um, so, stay tuned and make sure you watch all the videos for the week.